If anybody notices this flash blue or change colors, just shout. I need to fix that. Okay, so welcome to my talk. I'm glad to see everybody again in person at NedCamp, and thank you to our sponsors. Um, this talk is a little bit inspired by a show that we had back in May, uh, episode 348, called A Website's Covered Footprint. So we had a guest on talking, uh, named Jerry McGovern. He's just talking about how websites in general contribute to climate change, essentially, like how both the processing power and the device, as well as the processing power of the developers contributes to that, as well as like the physical waste. And it just became, I mean, I've always been very interested in performance. It's kind of something that I do for my clients. But um, after this show, it's something that's been, I feel like I think about it twice a day. Like, huh, I wonder how much processing power this particular site is taking. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. If you don't know me, uh, I'm founder of Enlight Development. I've been do doing Drupal since 2008, and I started in Drupal 5. I'm one of the co-hosts of Talking Drupal, uh, which we started in 2013. We're currently at 374 episodes, which will come out one day. Uh, we have five hosts, including alumnus, you know, me, John, Stephen, Jay, and Jason. Are you the one with the dog that... Uh, yes, I love it. I think it's a good host. Um, we've had 173 guests and we've had 22 guest hosts, some of which are here, uh, and some future guest hosts are here as well. Um, so, yeah, that's me. I am a Lego enthusiast, if you don't know that. Uh, this is a, hopefully this works, it was a little janky the other day. Last week, just for fun, um, so just a few seconds. <laughs> so, it took way longer than you think it would take to make something like that, but I appreciate it. Um, and yes, I really am a big fan of the modular buildings. The first thing I made of my own was that Drupal icon, I think way back in 2013, around when I started the podcast, and that's the Drupal 8 logo. Uh, so this was before Drupal 8 came out, it was I think when they first released the logo, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool, let me try to build that. I'm a huge supporter of open source, so obviously Drupal is open source, and it's one of the reasons why I've landed on that. Um, I'm a big fan of Docker. One of my previous talks was about before Lando and Doxel and DDEV kind of took over the landscape, I built my own called D4DD, which has gone by the wayside, but I use Docker for my home server setup, all that stuff is Docker, big fan of Docker. Home Assistant is my home automation system. It's one of the biggest open source communities on GitHub right now, uh, Ubuntu. This laptop is running Ubuntu. I've been on Ubuntu for 10 years now. Um, Caden Live is an open source video editing software we use for the podcast, and Audacity is something we use to clean up some audio. So anytime I'm interacting with technology, I'm looking for an open source solution. Um, I do encourage crowd participation. If you have a question, if you want to need to clarify something, just you know, wave. Uh, feel free to interrupt. It's not an interruption. I like to clarify things. So, uh, if any slide is just unclear or you want me to go over something again, feel free to ask questions. Okay. So, what is this talk? Uh, I'm talking about rebuilding my personal business site this year. I'm going to give a bird's eye view of the technologies that I use. I'm going to dive in quite a bit more into native web components um, than originally planned. I'm going to give a brief mention of what Storybook is and how I use it uh, as part of designing native web components. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Tome, which is a Drupal module. Uh, it's not going to be a full demo. Like I'm not going to build the site here live. There is a demo portion, um, but it's not just a full demo. So the problem was at the beginning of the year, my site was still on Drupal 7, like many people. Um, I, when I started my business, a lot of my clients were smaller. They were like you know, plumbers, painters, really local businesses with small sites. And Drupal 5, 6, 7 was perfect for those types of businesses. Um, I hosted them on a small media temple server. And as Drupal 7 is approaching end of life, I've been slowly migrating them off, mostly to other platforms, because a lot of them didn't really want to make the move to Drupal 9. Um, so as the number of clients on the server shrunk, it didn't really make sense for me to keep my own site there either. Um, 
my say, my say has also always been kind of a second thought, right? You know, client says take priority. I've, I've used it for experiments here and there, but I kind of wanted to build something that I could be proud of for once. Um, I also didn't want to have to worry about security maintenance. So security is very important, but when a security release happens, my priority is my clients. But I also can't have my site be hacked because that would be bad as well. Um, so I did want to find a way to have a secure site without having to worry about security maintenance immediately after a security release happens. And I was interested in finding the cheapest way to host it as possible, of course. Uh, so I said some of that stuff already, but I did want to use Drupal because I am primarily a Drupal developer. Um, I wanted it to be as fast as it could be as well. I mean, one advantage that I have is my site is a content site. You know, it's not an interactive site. People aren't logging in other than me. So I have some advantages there. I do want it to be fast. Okay, so let's start with some of the successes. Here's my Lighthouse scores uh, for the home page of the site. Um, scores 100 in performance accessibility, 92 in best practice in SEO. Um, obviously, the accessibility is only testing what computers can test in accessibility, um, but that's pretty good. And then, part of the podcast episode I mentioned, he mentioned a, a couple of websites that will scan your site and compare, you know, how heavy they are um, environmentally compared to others. And mine, mine scored fairly well, top 99 percent. So pretty happy with that. Okay. This is the browser level, so if you visit my homepage on an uncached request, it amounts to about 260 KB. It takes 232 milliseconds to load, which I'm pretty proud of. And once it's cached, it's even, it's even better. It's 150 KB and 130 milliseconds. So, I mean, it's just about as fast as it can be. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the technology that I used to get there. Um, so as I mentioned, it does use Drupal 9. Um, I'm using DDEV for local development. I'm also using that for my content entry. And then using Git, pretty straightforward. On the front end, I'm using the Olivero theme. I mean, the community put so much work into making that accessible, making it look good, updating it. Um, it's kind of no-brainer for me to use that. For any of the stuff that I was doing myself, I used native web components. I used Storybook to help me in that process of developing it. I am not a front-end developer, uh, so having a tool like that that helps like scaffold it and give that immediate feedback is, is pretty key. And then I use Webpack to bundle everything up for, uh, for use. Okay, native web components, so what are they? Uh, so native web components are part of the HTML spec, so they're, you know, they're available, <coughs> they work in pretty much every browser. Uh, you do need JavaScript on the page. It does need to work. Uh, there are some things with server-side rendering to try to make that better. Brian told me about a little bit of that yesterday. Um, but it does require JavaScript. Depending on how you're setting it up, you might need a CSS file or two to handle some variables that you set, uh, some light down stuff. And of course, you need to put the custom HTML on the page. Uh, one thing about naming conventions that um, your talk last hour actually made me think of is everybody likes to call their thing components and it causes problems. Designers call their things design components. Uh, we native web components that are called components and then developers call the little thing that they make in Drupal component as well. Um, and it's, it's a problem, especially because they don't always line up. So a designer might say this is a gridded component and if it's a full page um, grid layout of all the blogs on the website with nine in a row, they might consider that one component. And then they have another section on the page where it just shows the most three recent blogs, it's still a grid. The designer's gonna say that's a different component, right? Um, and then in native web component land, it's just one component, you know, it's just a grid. Does it have nine items or does it have three? And then the integration side, again, in Drupal, it's probably two different ones, because one's one view and one's a different view, right? So. I've tried solving this with some clients by calling them fr um, design components, front-end components, and integration components. I'm not entirely sold on that. If other people have better names, I would love to hear your opinions. Um, okay, now how did web components really come on my radar? I've heard about they've been around for years. The way they came on my radar was this year I had a project 
where one of the we were one of the requirements was we were building a design system for a government agency that has thousands of websites, and it, several of those websites are managed by different development teams, and those websites are on many different technologies. They're on Drupal, they're on Silverstripe, they're on WordPress, some of them are on Google sites, some of them are static. And one of the requirements was they needed to be able to hand the design system to the development teams and allow them to integrate. And of course, we could have done something like you know, Intuit, but that assumes that they have PHP. Um, you can handle, say, here's HTML, here's the CSS, and then they kind of have to rework it and make it, they have to rejigger everything to make it work in their system, they might have some overrides that interact. We didn't we didn't want that. We wanted to be able to say, here's the design system, here's how you integrate it, it's the same across the board on the integration layer, and the designs will look the same no matter what. Um, and because native web components are self-contained, they were the perfect solution. And on the integration side, um, one of the nice things is you can just throw the whole JavaScript and CSS file up on a CDN, and you just basically, for the integration side, you basically say, include these two files on the page, put this HTML on the page with the right attributes and, and <coughs> slots, and it will just work. Okay, so native web components, and kind of two key, well, there's a bunch of key things, but as far as the elements, there's two key things. One is you can create custom elements. Um, one thing that I like to do would, for some of my clients is I brand the elements. So mm -hmm. for the client, it's a little Easter egg for them. I mean, if you're building a design library that's going to be used across many com uh, companies, you obviously wouldn't do that. Um, you know, but all the native components of my site, for example, are prefixed with the light. And, um, the other thing that you can do is you can extend the existing elements. So this is one of the progressive enhancement things. So you can use, you can extend, for example, the paragraph tag. Um, so you, if it's a if you have a native web component or a paragraph tag, you just have to put uh, the is attribute. So it'd be is whatever the native element that you're, uh, custom element that you're creating. So it allows you to progressively enhance it um, on the page. The nice thing about custom elements is you can add any attributes you need. You can add any slots that you need. You have just complete control over what that shadow DOM looks like. just mentioned the Shadow Dom. Um, I like to say there's a bad analogy. The Shadow Dom is kind of like an iframe. It's a self-contained structure. Um, I say it's a bad analogy because it's not perfect. Um, but it does provide encapsulation. Um, I do say for people that aren't familiar with native web components, don't worry about the difference between open and closed. Just use open. I mean, you'll make your life a lot easier. And, it, and making it closed doesn't really protect it all that much more somebody that wants to change it. Okay. So piercing the Shadow DOM. So the nice thing about the Shadow DOM is it gives you complete control and encapsulation, but there are some things that will make it through, right? There are some things that the parent site will still interact with in your native web components. The three main things are fonts, custom CSS properties, which many people call CSS variables, and inheritable styles. Um, I find in most projects, honestly, that we are implementing these on, we're putting a reset in the Shadow DOM, so nothing is inherited. You basically just say, reset all, we're starting from scratch, we don't want any of your styles interacting with us, and it just, it just makes it very clean. Okay, there are two other things kind of related to native web components. Uh, the template element. So the template el element, the way I like to think about it, is a starting point for the Shadow DOM. It's like, what is the HTML? And a lot of patterns I use, you're literally just creating the template element here and then importing your HTML from a separate file to, for separation concerns. I'll show you what that looks like in a bit. Um, but it's really just a starting point for the Shadow DOM. Uh, slots, I like to call placeholder. So it's like, where in the Shadow DOM will this slot show up once it finishes rendering on a page? There are two different types of slots. One is anonymous, one is named. So if you can see on that screenshot, the top one is named image IMG. The other one is anonymous. Uh, and I'll show you what that means in a second. I will show you what that means right here. So for example, if we have a custom component called like grid, you can see that there are three elements that are children elements. There's a picture, a paragraph tag, and a div. 
The picture element it has the slot attribute with image, so that will show up in the image slot. And the other two don't have a slot attribute, so they would show up in an anonymous. So the nice thing about slots is you can put as many things as you want to. It's not one to one. So if you have more than one, it'll just stay in the same order that it is in the light DOM, just in the shadow DOM. There are some lifecycle callbacks. Uh, this is how you interact in JavaScript. This is how you interact with your own component or add the functionality. Constructor is where you create stuff. Connected callback. The most important thing about the connected callback is that's when attributes become available. So if you're trying to do something in your native web component based on an attribute, say you have a theme attribute that changes the background color of something, that has to happen in the connected callback. If you try to do it in the constructor, it won't work. Uh, disconnected callback is you basically use that to like remove event listeners, things like that. Uh, adopted callback, I have never used. So I, I think it's like if you have like a really interactive app and you can drag something from one tree to another, it'll like tweak something, but I haven't had to use it. An attribute change callback is if you want to allow things to change the attribute and have it interact. So if you, for example, if you render the page, um, a good example is classes. So if you render a page and you edit the HTML and you add a class or something, it will change, right? If you were to do the same thing on a native web component and change the theme from black to white, for example, nothing would happen unless you have an attribute change callback. Or you're using something like lit, which provides some of those helpers. It just, it just looks at, at it at the time of render, and that's all it is. So this is an example of a slot once it after it's been rendered. So you can see we have a named slot here. You can see the div is pointing down below. So the, the div slot according to content is in the light DOM, but it renders within the panel on the page. Okay. So some benefits. Um, you have way more control over styles, functionality than you're used to. Um, one of the main benefits, especially for that bigger project I was talking about, is container queries. So we had the ability to make all of the design components react on the container that they were put in, rather than the browser width. So when you're building a responsive site, you're saying, like, how wide is this browser? How should this thing look? But because we were handing it off to tons of different people, tons of different development teams, we could tell them, hey, put this in the main content area, but we don't know if their main content area has a sidebar or two sidebars. But with this, we can just say, like, how wide am I? Let me add a class. Let me figure out what layout I should handle. So we, we don't have to worry about them putting in the sidebar and squishing it. It's just going to show the mobile layout. Um, another benefit, it's native HTML and JavaScript. So I mean, it's easy to learn. And the other really big benefit that I found is integration. And this kind of speaks to your talk a little bit too. Integration is the same. It doesn't matter the technology. You're just putting, even if it's Twig, you're just putting, um, values into the attributes and the slots, and it's just taking care of the rest. Okay, before we move on, any questions, thoughts, concerns? Okay. So Storybook, I also use Storybook. I discovered Storybook earlier this year. I feel like I was really behind on that, but I have fallen in love with Storybook. It is, uh, I think it's one of the best tools out there for um, doing design work or, or de uh, development of uh, front end components. Um, there's a couple of really cool features. You know, controls is one of them. So, this is good for uh, both testing, but it's also good for content editors to kind of be able to, it gives them a way to interact with the component on the page. If you change the title, for example, here, it'll change the title in the component on the page live so they can see how their content will interact with it. So you can really quickly prototype something in Storybook, give it to them, let them enter a bunch of stuff and give you some feedback, rather than having to wait for the whole cycle, get it into Drupal, have them enter a bunch of content, learn the Drupal system, figure it out. You can just be like, here's the component, play with it, tell me what is missing, what's not working. And, and I found it's really sped up QA. I think one of the biggest advantages, though, is this accessibility tab. It's an add-on that you can add. It runs accessibility tests, again, Automated accessibility tests only cover 30 to 40 percent of accessibility issues, but this is a great way to make sure that something you're doing isn't breaking 
existing accessibility um, levels that you've achieved. Um, or if you're trying to fix an accessibility issue, this is a good way to say, hey, if I do this, does it fix it? If I do this, does it fix it? It just, you make the change, it refreshes the page, it runs the test again, immediate feedback. It's, it's fantastic. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the hosting. Um, so I mentioned I wanted to be as low class as I could. Uh, so I kind of lumped Tome in here. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Tome in a minute, but I'm hosting on Netlify. Netlify is a static site host, and if you have a small site and you don't need any like forms or you don't have a ton of traffic, hosting is free. So I'm pretty happy with that. I can't complain. And if they, you know, if they get rid of the free plan, I could pay them. If they go away, because they give free hosting to everybody, <laughs> um, it's a static site. I could throw it up on Docker for five bucks a month, and I wouldn't, even have, I wouldn't have to worry about it. Okay, so let's talk about Tome. So Tome, is anybody familiar with Tome? Has anybody used it? Okay, uh, so Tome is a static site generator. I would say it's generally best for smaller sites or larger sites that don't change very often. Um, so for example, my site has 30 pages. It takes maybe uh, 30 seconds to process, so it's not a big deal if I need to update something. Um, I've heard that if you have a page with 100,000 pages, it can take 10, 12, 13 hours to process. So if you're, if that's a page, if that's a site that only changes once a month, that's fine. It doesn't matter that it takes 18 hours. You can just run that on a development machine. If it's something that changes twice a day and it takes 18 hours, well, it's not going to work. Um, it does generate static content. So basically, it goes through your routes, renders the page, grabs the HTML, and outputs it in a directory. Um, I found it took minimal configuration. I basically installed it and it worked. Um, and one other thing that it can do that was an added bonus for me uh, is that you can also export your content. So export your content to JSON. So you can store your content in Git, which means that my site doesn't have like anywhere, that, like the Drupal portion doesn't have anywhere that it lives. If I need to make changes, I clone down from Git. I bootstrap using Tome Sync, and then it, you know, bootstraps Drupal, imports the configuration, imports the content. My site exists there. I can make the changes I want, export everything, and deploy it. That being said, I do have it running on a couple of machines, like in the, in, in DDEV, because I don't. I mean, I've only been using it for six months, so I don't know if that content export is going to work forever. Um, but then again, I only have 30 pages, so if I lose it, I can just. So the process it was for me, you know, I, I built the site locally. I basically just installed a fresh Google 9 site, enabled Olivero, added a couple of content types that I needed, um, enabled the three, the four Tome modules. Uh, Tome and Tome Base are both like kind of API modules. Static is the one that generates the static site, and Sync is the one that handles the content. So then I did my uh, I'm using air quotes for people watching later. My design and build process, I am not a front-end designer, I'm not a designer, um, but there were a couple things I wanted, I had a couple accordions, things like that, so I did that work in Storybook. I did the integration with the theme, entered my content. Then I just need to run a Webpack process. I need to run the Drush Tome Static. I think there's one argument I need to pass there. You need to say what the end domain is gonna be because it passes that reference in. And then you just upload the files to Netlify. So that's the big, the big secret about making my site fast, uh, spoiler alert, is it's static. You know, it's very easy to make a static site fast. I think the really interesting thing, though, is that um, when you're thinking about a static site, many times, at least in the Drupal world, you're thinking of Gatsby or something like that, uh, which, which is a viable option, I think, especially for larger sites, but I think a lot of times um, clients that have like a little microsite that they want, I think something like this is ideal for that because you can host Drupal somewhere else, you still want to keep updated and maintained and secure, but it's not the front facing thing, it's not the one that's going to face the brunt. And with a static site like this, you throw Cloudflare in front of it, it's going to handle 
any amount of traffic that you send at it. You don't like it almost takes that out of the equation. Uh, any questions about any of this so far? Okay. I have a question. Sure. So, is it uh, my understanding is that you're using Drupal just for content management and applying a template to your content, and then basically <coughs> pushing that content to uh, through Tone into host to host your content, and that's how it's accessed. My question is: Is there a way to does Tome provide an alternative to Drupal for updating and managing content? So the question was, does Tome provide um, an alternative to Drupal for updating and managing? I think the answer is no. I mean, Tome is a Drupal module only, so I think the answer is no. I think they provide um, ways to hook into Netlify a little bit cleaner. Like, I'm, I just manually set up Netlify and manually upload because it's pretty straightforward. I think the big thing that, uh, I think Tome does some integration work there that can help you with that too. But it, it's a Drupal module. Uh, it's, it's only going to work with Drupal. Okay. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Okay, so we have some time for a demo. So I'm going to first show you the actual site that we're talking about. So here's my site. I'm going to refresh. So it's fast. Um, there's a couple, uh, there's, there's only four native web components on this particular site, so I'll just walk, quickly walk through them. The first one is the page title, um, and the reason why I actually did that as a native web component was I was running into an issue where um, I was getting accessibility issues because the header tag was, the wrong, was in the wrong order, because Drupal likes to just throw random header you know, H3s and H5s and whatever, so I, I think I put a little logic in there to basically be like, where am I? Am I in the page title or not? What level should I be? Um, and it was also just add another one. The other thing that I added was a rich text one, and I think I forget which talk I mentioned, but really it was just to give me a HTML selector to say to apply styles to. So I could, and so instead of seeing like p tags or this. P tags within a div or this, I can just say P tags within an enlightened rich text, use this font. And it just it just is a more specific selector. Um, the other component I did, so I think the example component of the day is going to be accordions. Um, and I think the only thing, oh, I actually have to fix that hover color because that's not going to be accessible. But I think the only thing that this accordion really does, other than kind of the defined content that is, I won't say difficult, but slightly difficult in just native CSS is the um, the border. So you'll notice that the border like kind of like eases in a little bit and um, eases out when you close. Um, it's a little a little finicky in just generic CSS. Um, and then the final one is um, it's a static site, so you can't really do a whole lot of interactivity, but I also don't want to have to update it every week when an episode comes out. Uh, so this native web component basically just reaches out to YouTube and pulls in the most recent episode in, in the list. Uh, so those are the four native web components. And now I will, I did not run start before. So I will talk through some of the integration points, and some of these will be a little bit different if you were in Brian's talk this morning, it'll be a little bit different because I'm using just native JavaScript. I'm not using any libraries like Lit or uh, Polymer. Okay, so um, one of the first things you'll notice here is, so uh, you probably can't see that, can you? Is that, are you able to see that? Can everybody see that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So one of the first things that you'll notice here is that there's five files in this accordion folder. There's an HTML file, JavaScript, uh, a markdown file, SAS file, and a stories file. Um, so with Webpack, you have the ability to have kind of separations of concerns. I like having HTML and an HTML file, JavaScript and a JavaScript file, and SAS and a SAS file. Um, the markdown file and the story file are all about storybook and documentation. Um, so they're not part of the component themselves. And then JavaScript, um, the 
JavaScript is where the actual native web component piece happens. So because we were using Webpack or in any other bundler will have similar functionality, we can import the SAS and we can import the HTML and then you know it, 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 it just handles that. One thing that I've noticed for performance reasons, um, when we initially started doing this, so if you if I scroll down here to the bottom, you'll notice that I'm creating a template element here and then I'm importing that HTML from the HTML file into the template element, and that's how I'm, that's what I'm attaching in the Shadow DOM. And initially, when I when we started building native web components, we were doing something similar with the style tag. We were generating a style tag, importing the CSS, or the SAS, putting that as a child element, and then attaching it. But I found that creating elements is far more expensive than doing a query selector and just appending a child to it. So in a system like the other one that I was talking about where there might be 30, 40 web components on a page, it's way more performant to just have that style tag already in the HTML template and attach to it than to create that style in the constructor. Um, the other thing that I found, and this is really a lot less extreme performance wise, it's faster to look for a class than it is to look for an element, for whatever reason. Um, so that's why we have the ridiculously named STL class on the style tag <laughs> in this template. So you'll see every template requires a style tag, and then we put this class on it. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are lifecycle um, methods. There's a constructor. Um, this is where you create the shadow, you say whether it's open or closed, this is where you attach the template, this is where we set the styles. The constructor is the thing that you can think about. This happens before the component renders. Um, so you can do anything here that is interacting with the shadow DOM template. So you can set pointers to, if you have um, elements in that HTML that you're gonna need to do something to, you can set pointers to them at this point, and that will always work. You can do a lot of things with the light DOM here. So if you need to see, for example, if you need to see that there's a particular child element, it, whether it's slotted or not, you can do that here. You can't interact with attributes here. Uh, you, they just, they'll work in Storybook, and again, calling him to Brian, talking to him yesterday, the reason why they'll work in Storybook is probably because Storybook has so much JavaScript, it just takes forever to render. Um, you end up just, so that's one big gotcha. If you're doing native web components in Storybook, you need to test them outside of Storybook too, because they'll render way faster and things will break. <laughs> so you need to get, you, you need to find those patterns. Um, one of the things that we've done too is, it's not showing up here because this is a much simpler element, but we follow, I followed a pattern where we set a DOM object and then we just set all the pointers under the object that we need. And then we, if you use BEM, um, if you use BEM on the classes in the Shadow DOM, then you can create a small helper function to just e quickly get all those selectors that you need to attach to. Um, so it, it makes it a little bit more efficient. Okay, then um, in the connected callback, that's when you can interact with attributes. Again, another small thing, this is just a general programming thing, this might be super obvious to other people, but it was something that was helpful for some of the front end developers. Um, you don't want to just get attributes everywhere, like you should just set it to a constant if you need it once, and then use it as many times as you need. Um, so we're doing that here, we're getting a title attribute. Um, again, another thing that I found, inner text is way faster than inner HTML. Um, I, I think that if you're using inner HTML too much in a component, then you should be looking at slots. Uh, you shouldn't be converting essentially plain text attributes into HTML. I think that's a, probably a security issue as well. Okay. Uh, CSS is kind of unremarkable here. One thing to note here though, and this is really, really important, um, because you are, so one of the things that people really get used to in CSS is just having an import at the top, right? You're just gonna import, you, you set some variables, you just import that everywhere that you need it, you use those variables. 
we're used to code, great, right? One of the things with native web components, though, is it's storing the generated CSS in the shadow DOM once it's been compiled. So if you include something like a reset or a variable in five web components, you're getting a copy of that in five web components. So think about it if you scale to 100 web components. If you have a one kilobit CSS file that you include in every single one, you're getting 100 kilobit. Your compiled native web components get 100 kilobits fatter. Um, so we, we actually ran into that problem with that other project. We were you know, just adding, you know, doing the, some normal front end design principles, just adding that kind of stuff, and things were just ballooning. Um, CSS variables will rescue you, because the thing is, you can set CSS variables once on the host or the root element, depending on how you set it up, and then you just use those CSS variables here, and then you're just including that 15, one kilobit, 15 kilobit file once it's included on the light DOM, and all of your components have access to it. So you want to be very careful about imports in CSS on native web components. More so than JavaScript. If you have a JavaScript helper, like you, you'll see here, we have a little helper for fonts. You don't have to worry about that whatsoever, because the bundler will say, hey, that's the same JavaScript file. I'm just going to have one reference to it. I'm going to call that function. It's not going to blow up your project whatsoever. So importing HTML and CSS, you have to be a little bit careful about which you might not be used to, <coughs> importing JavaScript, never a problem. Okay, a few minutes here. Let's see if I can show you the integration layer. Um, okay, so there are a couple of things. So let's just look at the Webpack packaging, because there's a couple of really cool things in here. So one of the things that I did here is this combined entry function basically just looks at the components directory, says what are all the components, uses that as an entry point. So it's grabbing all of the components in that directory and creating one, one file. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool here is with, um, oh, I don't actually have this set up here, so I, I can't actually show you, but, um, if this interests you, I can show you after. But with Webpack, you can actually pass variables to your CSS compiler. So if you have something like, for example, we have a CDN that holds all the assets that we use in CSS. And that CDN in Storybook needs to be local. And in production, it has to be whatever the CDN is. So you can pass in CSS variables to your compiler to reference environments, for example, so that, you know, so you don't have to like do a deployment to get an icon up on the CDN before you can see it in Storybook. So it's, it, it took a fair amount to get that working. Um, I will say that one of the things, one of the issues that I haven't fully solved, and I'm gonna look at some of the lit HTML stuff to maybe solve, is that in libraries, generally, you just include the one file that you need, and then you let Drupal kind of handle like, oh, I need this, I need that. I found that Webpack is significantly better at merging multiple files into one than it is splitting out the individual pieces. So what I mean by that is if we build, uh, let's take the other project as an example. There's 80, there's 80 web components in that design library. If we compile all those 80 web components into one file, which we needed to for, like I said, it has to be across multiple projects. Um, it's like 400K, which is pretty big. But if you compile them separately as 80 separate web components, you say, just, down, just grab the ones you need. If you need these four on this page and these five on this page, grab what you need. Well, the whole 80 is like three megabytes. It's, it's huge. There's huge efficiencies in just having one file. And for that particular project, we looked at it and said, well, the average page has five components, and the file size for five components is already bigger than 400K. So just load the one file once, it's more efficient, and it's easier to integrate because you don't have to remember which one's which. Um, so, yeah, I might look at lit HTML because it might be nicer to just pull in lit when needed, but, um, but yeah, we're using Webpack to, to pull it together here. Okay. Um, 
and then I'll just show you a quick template and then I'll open up for questions again before we close. And if there's no questions, then I'll let you guys free earlier. So there's the templates. So if we look at, I'm using paragraphs, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, actually, I follow a different pattern here. Again, I built this seven months ago when I hadn't fully integrated it. I was just testing some stuff. But, but again, I'm just outputting and letting the accordion here. There's a title attribute. And then I'm outputting the slotty content below. Um, sure. Oh, thank you. Um, so one of the things that I find, other than views, which is a question that I asked uh, earlier, other than views, I found it's, it makes a lot of the integrations in paragraphs or storage, you know, whatever content entry system you're using to build your backend components, it's kind of, it makes it more of a one-to-one -one, um, integration. It, it feels much more clean. Like you have one template, you're putting out a custom tag with some information. Another template has another custom tag with some information. So it becomes a lot more straightforward. You're not pulling pieces in uh, kind of willy-nilly. So that's that's all I have for today. Any questions? Any thoughts? I was just wondering, your, uh, what were you looking at, large view there, in terms of your tree? Did you do all of this in your theme? And is Storybook also inside your theme there? Like everything yeah. together? So let me, so the question was, what are we looking at in the, um, I, I think in the theme tree, how does that work? So. Yeah. Actually, I forgot my page of notes. That was on my notes to go over, so I'm glad you asked. Um, so if we look at this, this is my enlightened theme. Um, and I will say I use Olivero here because I thought it was good, a good base. I'm working on another client site. We use the, the starter kit or the recipe. I forget what it's called. Like the way you generate a new site. Starter. That is way cleaner and way easier to integrate this with. Um, so what I did, I. Uh, yeah, Storybook is installed as an NPM dependency in this theme. There's a Storybook folder. That's where I have all of the Storybook configuration. Um, I have a Components folder, um, which is where, like, whenever I need a new component, it goes in there. Um, I'm using actually something called HiGen Generator, which is what this Templates folder is in. So basically, you can say the name of my component is Enlightened paragraphs and the classes paragraph and like paragraphs or whatever and it will generate the all the files that you need and replace all those references so it's much easier to, to generate new components um, config CSS those are all the arrow theme things dist is like the output for the CSS file and uh, native web components although I don't have a custom CSS file for this particular site um, fonts global uh, fonts is a Olivero theme. Global is where I put all the helper methods for the components that I use. Images, I think, is Olivero. Yeah, that's Olivero. JS, public. like most of these are just Olivero. The only one, other ones that are important are uh, templates, which is the Drupal templates, and then uh, the libraries uh, file. Uh, you'll notice I have Storybook static here too. So the other thing that I did is I put because Storybook has a static generator too. I actually released Storybook onto my site, so you can see kind of how it works here. So like I said, you have controls. If you edit it, you'll see it changes live. Accessibility. If you make a tweak, it will change automatically. And I've been trying to convince every client that uses Storybook that they should do this for their project too. Most of them don't go for it. But I think that's actually time. I mean, I, I'm around. For, if there's more questions, I'm really excited about native web components. And if anybody has any thoughts or ideas on how to improve integration, really the biggest problem <coughs> I've run into is views. Like if you're trying to combine a bunch of different things into one, like. It's hard. You can't output native web component. You can't output custom HTML elements in uh, in views. 
just gets stripped out by security. But there's also the other side. You don't want to just disable filtering because <laughs> that would be a disaster. Uh, so, okay, thank you. Thank you.